Markets are in a tailspin right now. I'm sure you've seen what's been going on, but I need to break it down. I will give you every nuance that you need to know and none of that which you don't. I'm going to show you the charts. I'm going to give you the analysis and I'm going to give you some information related to what's happening underneath the hood. Let's begin. Before I show you the charts, I just wanted to give you this. Jeremy Grantham doubles down on crash call, says sell-off has started. GMO co-founder predicts a drop of almost 50% in benchmark stocks. Investor favors oversee value stocks, cash, commodities, and gold. Now, throughout this period, he hasn't exactly been accurate. You looked at what happened in previous instances, calling multiple crashes. Yes, absolutely. This time around, the Federal Reserve has stumped everybody. And that's why so many people have simply capitulated to this and put all of their money in and now you have the financial gurus all over youtube posting videos showing the world how smart they can be in a bull market now you see one example of what had happened here with netflix as well as peloton this company here down 20 percent now what changed over this period here of literally one day that's the after hours down 20 percent in a single day well they said they're not going to get the subscribers that they did before they increased the price on the current subscribers to kind of make up for that their revenue and of course that's not going to work long term you could look at this over the period and i'm just showing you as the the netflix stock over this you know, past couple of years. So 2019 into 2020, it's looking great. And then you have this fall that of course was early 2020, everything was falling. And then this massive surge upward, it hits 572. And then it's chopping along throughout 2020. And then we get this extended surge because, okay, I think we're going to go into lockdowns again. I think everybody's going to start to have a problem. They've got some good movie deals coming up. They've got contracts. Things are happening. Things are wonderful. And the stock hits nearly 700. And in a very, very short period of time, in fact, this peak up here, November 18th of 2021, it was near $700. And now today, as I record this in the after hours, it is $400. Okay, this stock got absolutely hammered down. It's one example, but you look at what happened with Peloton. It's the same thing, okay? If I show you here, look at it. Over this time frame, I mean, this stock was at its peak 170, and today, 25. 170, 25. Why? Because all of this leading up in 2020, in through that period, I guess it peaked out in the beginning of 2021, eventually that euphoria runs out. So many people have started to wonder, is that happening to the general market or is it just one, two or three stocks? Well, of course, we have seen over this period, you've got stocks like Apple and others like Amazon and Microsoft that have very strong core businesses and of course, the attention has all been on them. If you've been investing in broad-based ETFs, it would look like everything's okay. But it's much more deep than that. Look at who's buying. By the way, you tell me if you see analysis this deep on other, other channels, please, because I want to know what's going on. There's, you know, it's basically just my friends that are left here watching these videos, not many... Uh, viewers, almost zero new viewers, by the way. Uh, the algorithms have they've done a great job, let's just say. Anyway, you can see the retail investors buying it up, okay? This is basically early, you know, late 2021 into 2022, this time frame I'm showing you. And the retail investors have been buying in. So they've been buying in as the market. So the market's been declining and they've been programmed. All right, now's the time. So they, they've been buying here, they're buying here, they're buying here. And is this the bottom? Is it the bottom? Well, nobody knows. Anybody who tells you that they know is um, not aware of what's happening. I'm showing you the broad uh, indexes. And what we're looking at is S&P 500, Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, and of course the Russell and all of them since, you know, 
average this out around, let's say, the beginning of the year. So, so since that point here, it's just been down. It's been down, down, down. And through, throughout, we've been seeing by the dip, by the dip, by the dip. You get punished if you're doing that indiscriminately buying the dip. There, there are ways to do this accurately. I've shown some examples before in the last little while. You can't just indiscriminately buy, please. Okay, not especially not during these times. This is coming from Bank of America, and they show us some, some good stats. I wanted to give it to you really quickly. Earnings explain nearly 50% of the market's returns pre-global financial crisis, but only 21% of post-global financial, financial crisis returns. Okay, Then it just gives you a little bit of an explanation of what's happening with the Fed's balance sheet as it correlates to stocks. More than half of non-earnings-driven market cap changes were explained by the Fed balance sheet expansion post-global financial crisis. That's huge. It shows you how key the Federal Reserve has been to these stocks. And so while people would agree that, okay, it is the Fed. The Fed is your friend. Don't fight the Fed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I love that line, by the way, don't fight the Fed, because if the Fed is backing out, should we now be fighting the Fed? Right. Well, I don't think Reddit's going to be using that line too much any, anymore. But anyway, um, what I see here is very, very key to understand is that the Federal Reserve printing less money doesn't even matter if they're going to increase interest rates. You know, we're not going to get the 20% Volcker type interest rates likely. It's not going to happen. But what, as I have said many times before, think about what has happened, the conditions in the previous cycles. My guess is somewhere around 0.75 to 1.0 on the Fed funds rate would be enough to crush this thing. And that's only a few rate hikes away. So, you know, if they're going in that direction, what happens to stocks? Well, historically, it doesn't look very good. I'm not saying that this right now, what we're seeing in the markets, you know, to, as you watch this video, in fact, the markets could be going higher. But look at what happened on was a Thursday's trading session. Uh, Thursday's trading session, the market was up unbelievably. It was doing so well at the beginning of the day. Suddenly, things turned around. Okay, so watch out. Be very careful. That's all I'm saying. Fed contributed more to corporate cash, not necessarily to consumer cash. And I think most people know this, but you can see the difference between the M2 and the Fed balance sheet. And for the average consumer, it's not Fed money going directly into their bank account. That's clear. But when we see money being pumped out through the fiscal side, through the government side, well, then, of course, that can make its way to the consumer. I don't know how much makes it to the consumer anyway, but clearly the Fed is helping out the, you know, the corporates, the the big banks, the institutions, and so on, more than anything else. Let's talk about yields. Let's talk about bonds. Let's look at the markets here for the last few minutes of this video. Stick with me. I got a lot of detail. If you appreciate it, simply hit that thumbs up button. It's right down there. Hit it. Not softly. If you hit, can actually smash it, that usually works uh, better. Yeah, definitely. Surging real yields jar the markets, eyeing the end of easy money era. Inflation-adjusted treasury yield jump during the January sell-off. Markets brace for pullback of massive stimulus. That's right. The market is simply pricing it in. What happens tomorrow, we don't know. But as of right now, that's what's going on. Look at the negative yields that we're seeing today in real, in real terms. Real treasury bond yields. Real Treasury bond yields fell into deeply negative territory in 2021. In elementary economic models, this event taken in isolation would qualify as a plus for economic growth in 2022 and would be consistent with the strength indicated by fourth quarter 2021 tracking models. It's supposed to be good, but, but, there's a big but there, Lacey Hunt, they're referring to, had a different view, however, his analysis shows that negative real yields are associated with recessions. Debt overhang and demographics make the matter worse. They give the chart going back from 1902 up until the present, and that's what we see. So what does that mean? The conditions of today are not positive. 
Let me just break it down in English. Okay, let me give you the dictionary explanation. The Urban Dictionary, maybe? I don't know. This is just a way, by the way, I'm not exactly clear on what the Urban Dictionary is, so I shouldn't be using that term, but it just gives you an insight as to what's happening. I will include the links in the description as always, but let me just tell you, things are not good in that respect. And that is not, you know, that could be, you know, three months from now, it could be a year from now, nobody knows. But ultimately, it just shows the weakness there. This is the real yields, 1870 to 2021, and it's in the negative right now. In the negative. You haven't seen this because there hasn't been that much inflation over the period. But if you look back, okay, 1980, what has happened since? Well, of course, that's been declining. Declining, declining, declining. Now we are in this negative range. We saw this back in the 70s, of course, because of how high inflation was. And then what did the central bank do? Well, they had to go wild on the Fed funds rate. All, you know, not all central banks, but many, many went in the same direction. Real 10-year government bond yields, Japan, Euro, UK, and the US, all generally in the same direction over the last couple of decades. Okay? Now, let's get a little deeper. I just wanted to show you something really quickly before we finish off this video. We're looking at what's happening with imports because this affects you directly. Imports take dramatically longer to reach US as bottlenecks bite. I just covered in the previous video to this that very few people watched talking about how the truckers coming from US into Canada were saying, uh, you know, you got a mandate here, you got this restriction here, I can't come across. Suddenly, Canada can't get the food that it needs. Now, as I have seen many times in the comments, and I do appreciate this, because I'll do videos about store shelves, don't have the products, bananas in shortage, my goodness, hopefully, hopefully that's not widespread. Looking at all these different things, and other people will say, not at all stocked shelves, no problems here, nothing there. But what I have noted, and I've seen this personally, I ask a lot of questions to everybody that I can personally, as well as you know, looking into the data, I ask for the comments and so on. Many people think that is this is like, oh, he's just trying to get the algorithms. Look, the algorithms have it in for me. It's over. It's over in that respect. I'm literally obsessed with the data. I'm obsessed with this information at this point. Okay, It makes no financial sense for me to do this. That is just between you and I. Okay, If you made it 13 minutes into the video. Regardless, what I'm seeing here is that as we moved on over the, these last few months, Things went from some areas being completely stocked up to now say, oh, suddenly I can't get that lettuce. Suddenly I can't get those, you know, potatoes or whatever it might be. And that type of thing is, of course, nonlinear. It's not, okay, now there's no more of this across the board. No. Depends on your area, depends on which port you normally would get your products from. It depends on the truckers in that area who are bringing it to the uh, different businesses and so on. A lot of those things. But what I'm seeing here is a big problem. And unfortunately, uh, there is no resolution to this in the short term. Trans-Pacific eastbound routes are taking longer than ever. So what I'm seeing is still the same conditions from before. Really, uh, you know, I hate to be the messenger like this. It's just getting worse. And so what do we do? What, what can we do? Well, the one thing is to take care of yourself and your family first. Um, I don't tell people what I do personally, but I think it would be wise to be prepared. 
Okay, so if you don't have your food situation in order, you don't have an orchard in your backyard and you're not growing a garden that could feed an army, no, you got to buy some stuff that stays a long period of time. Maybe that's beans and rice and pasta and, you know, lentils and all these different things that if you keep them dry, if you keep them in a cool space, they will go for months or years if they're packed properly. And I think that that's just wise. Like, it's not the astronaut food. I'm talking about things that are simply, you know, you might eat them, and you might not even want to eat them. But hey, you can keep them. That's the point anyway. Just something simple like that. What about your water situation, your energy situation? Are you able to deal with a crisis, at least to the level experienced in the 1970s? maybe to the level of the 1930s. Can you deal with that? If not, I think people should start to ask that question, what can I do today right now with the funds, with the resources and the knowledge that I have? So that's up to you to decide what to do. If you appreciate the information, hit that thumbs up button. If you've got anything to share, always put it down in the comments below. I read all the comments now, 10 years and run it. Okay. That's all. If you um, haven't seen this video yet, you definitely want to check it out. Click it and I'll see you there.